Well, once again, thank you for joining us for this series of uh, lessons on spiritual gifts. And those of you around the world watching by DVD, thanks for being here. And you join some eager students here in the classroom who are also taking part in this adventure. Well, in this session, session 17, we'll be talking about the gift of faith. And in the last session, we began our study by the gift of administration. And that, in essence, is being the pilot of a ship, being the helmsman steering the ship from one port to another. Someone else sets the goal, the destination, and the person with the gift of administration decides how do we get there. So let's move on to the story of uh, the gift of faith. And there is a famous story that goes back to the 1800s where there was a tightrope walker in the country of France named Jean-Francois Baudin. And he was known throughout Europe for his dangerous feats of placing a tightrope between one point and another and then balancing and walking across it. And he wanted to come and do the same thing for American audiences. And he thought, where would be the best place to do it? He picked Niagara Falls, a very well-known uh, rapid that then goes into a falls that is very powerful. It is an enormous amount of energy going over the top. And this would be very dangerous. It's a place that many people in my country go to visit. In fact, a lot of people who are on their honeymoon go to visit Niagara Falls. So they stretch the tightrope from the American side all the way over to the Canadian side so that Jean-Francois Baudin could demonstrate his talent of walking across the tightrope. Crowds of people gathered to see this amazing feat. And Jean-Francois did not disappoint them walked across the front of the tightrope to the Canadian side. And then he rode back on a bicycle. Amazing. And he did other feats where he carried weights as he walked across. And all types of things that you can imagine. And the crowd was astounded and amazed. And so one day, as the crowds gathered, and they grew bigger by the day, he had a wheelbarrow on top of the wire, one that you carry dirt from one place to another. And this time he did something unusual. He turned to the crowd and he said, do you believe I can walk across this tightrope with a wheelbarrow in front of me? And the crowd goes, we believe, yes, we've seen you do it. He says, do you think that I will fall? No, we haven't seen you fall. You've done amazing things. He said, sir, do you believe that I can do it? I'm absolutely convinced you can. Very good. Get in the wheelbarrow. Now that's the gift of faith. If you got in that wheelbarrow, you would have complete confidence that Jean-Francois Bondine could get to the other side. In a sense, Jean-Francois, in this analogy, would be God. And we would be the person getting into God's wheelbarrow. Well, the gift of faith sounds like a gift we all should have. I mean, shouldn't everybody have faith? Well, yeah. But these are people that the Spirit empowers to believe no matter what, who would not hesitate to get inside the wheelbarrow, who believe so strongly in God's promises that they would never ever doubt them for one single moment. I don't know about you, but this is not a gift I have. There are times I have doubted God. There are times I wondered, where have you gone, God? Are you still there? And there are times, to my shame, that I have felt like God abandoned me. People with the gift of faith would never, ever feel such a thing. The definition of faith is one of the few terms that the Bible actually defines. 
I've mentioned this before, but let's actually look at the verse. If you would open up your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11, there is a verse, verse 1, that I would urge every single Christian to memorize. I mentioned previously in, in an earlier session, the gift of meditation is one that we have forgotten. So is the gift of memorization, and the two go hand in hand. If you memorize scripture, you have it in your mind, it transforms you. When you me meditate on that verse, it accelerates the transformation process. Here's an easy verse for you to memorize, and one that you will use often. Hebrews 11, chapter 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. What a beautiful definition. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for. If the person got in the wheelbarrow, they would hope they were not going to fall. If they had the gift of faith, they wouldn't even think about that. They would believe that God, represented as Jean-Francois Baudin, would get them to the other side. And they would be certain of what they do not see. They couldn't see themselves going across. They hadn't seen it happen. But in their mind, they could see it happen. And they believed it, and they did it. This is the gift of faith. So I encourage you to memorize this verse. I don't think you'll be disappointed if you begin the process of memorizing Scripture and just take short verses like this to start and then move on to tougher ones, longer ones. Now would you please turn in your Bible back to uh, the section we've been looking at in 1 Corinthians 12 where the different gifts are mentioned. And we have often come back to this verse 1 Corinthians 12, 7. We'll begin there. Now to each one the manifestation is, of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of faith, to another the message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. It may have occurred to you how do we in fact know that this is a spiritual gift? That this isn't just faith that everybody should have? Well, God in his infinite wisdom chose to use another verb to distinguish regular faith from spiritual faith, the gift of faith. If you will look back to uh, verse 8, it says to one, there is given through the Spirit. There is a Greek word that continually appears whenever it is a spiritual gift. It is the well-known word charisma. What is charisma? It is someone who radiates positive energy. People are drawn like a magnet to that person. There's something special about the quality that they have, something that other people do not have, and other people can't quite figure out. Why is this person so magnetic? Why are they so charismatic? Well, that will appear any time, that word, charisma, any time there is a spiritual gift. And it appears there through the Spirit and has to do with all of these uh, different gifts mentioned uh, following that phrase. So, in the Greek, faith is pistos, pistos. And for those of you following in Strong's Concordance, it is G4102. Well, the meaning of this word is conviction of truth, strong belief and trust, firmly persuaded, having confidence, being assured, trusting in the word and promises of God. All of those apply to that beginning story of the wheelbarrow. Strong belief and trust that I'm going to get to the other side safely. 
I'm firmly persuaded and I have confidence it's going to happen. I feel assured enough that, yes, I'm willing to trust and get in the wheelbarrow. These terms accurately describe faith, but just not ordinary faith. Faith that the Spirit empowers that goes over and above the faith that those of us who walk with Christ usually have. The definition that we're going to use of faith is to firmly believe that God is trustworthy. To firmly believe that God is trustworthy. And what is the purpose of this gift in the body of Christ? It is to anticipate where God is heading and believing we'll get there. It is sensing that God is doing something and believing that it actually will come to pass and having no doubts about it. We have mentioned there are certain roles in the church, founding a church, instructing a church, caring for the church, managing the church, giving a message to the church in an unusual situation. So which role does the gift of faith fall into? Obviously caring for the church. It also is a support gift. And as we mentioned in a previous session, these are gifts that don't just stand alone. There's no ministry in the church where you say, I'm going to be the faith person. You know, my ministry is just to walk around and I'll be faith, you know, exhibit faith to everybody. It comes and attaches itself to other gifts to make that other gift far more powerful, kind of supercharged, so that it really makes the person effective as the Spirit works through them. So what are the gifts that typically attach to the gift of faith? Well, any of them can, but there are a certain common cluster of gifts with each one of the gifts that I'll be referring to. And in this case, think as I mentioned two gifts, how much it makes sense in the wisdom of God that he would match the gift of faith with this particular gift. Often the gift of faith comes alongside and supports leadership. Wouldn't it make sense that a person who's the leader and is casting a vision for where the church is going would actually have faith that it's going to happen? I would hope so. Not every leader has that gift, but many do. And then I think the most obvious one is that the gift of intercession, the gift of praying, comes along, or is, uh, has the gift of faith come alongside to support it. If I'm praying, wouldn't it make sense that I should have faith? I mean, supernatural faith that things are actually going to happen? I have to admit, sometimes when I pray, I'm not exactly sure that what I'm praying about is going to happen. And sometimes my prayer life is fairly weak. I usually pray the give me prayers. Give me this, give me that. Or the do me prayers. Do this for me, do that for me. People who have the gift of intercession, they pray for a wide variety of needs within the church and around the world. And they must have this gift of faith to believe that God is in fact going to do what you are praying about that's in line with his word. Once again, I went to the commentaries. Uh, I want to not trust the commentaries as being the sole place that uh, the Word of God is explained. Often, the Bible itself explains the Bible itself far better than a commentator. But these are people who have studied the Word intensely. It has been their territory for them to look at the Word of God, to understand it in the Greek and the Hebrew, the original text, and then help us understand what in fact the Word means. So, David Gusick, who is a well-known commentator, says this definition of faith. It is the unique confidence that a person has to trust God 
against all circumstances. I would substitute the phrase, no matter what. It is the unique confidence to trust God against all circumstances. A very well-known commentator from a century or two ago is Matthew Henry. And he writes, The gift of faith is being enabled by God to trust Him in any emergency and to go on the way of their duty to own and profess the truths of Christ, whatever the difficulty or danger. You see, the gift of faith is, no matter what's happening around you, despite what the obstacles or the difficulties are, despite the danger that's involved, you believe that God will do what God says He will do. If God says it, they believe it, and that's enough for them. There's an old hymn that we sing that says that. If God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. That's the gift of faith. And then, as I went on, the most recent tool that we have to help us understand the Gospels, ministry tools on the internet, they say it is to be firmly persuaded of God's power and His purposes to accomplish His will and purpose, and to display such a confidence in Him and His Word that circumstances and obstacles don't shake their confidence. So that's what the commentators have to say. We've mentioned before that sometimes it's nice to have a picture in our head. A chair. I thought I would tell you in case you didn't know. What is the purpose of a chair? Isn't it to support the weight of the person who's going to sit down? Whenever you sit down on the chair, do you ever stop and think, I wonder if that chair is going to support my weight? Hmm. I don't even think about it. I just sit down. That, in essence, is an illustration of the person with the gift of faith. They know that God is going to support the church, that God is going to do what he says. And they sit down without even thinking about it. And of course, God is so rock solid, so firm, that he actually does what he says he's going to do, what his purpose is. They believe it with all their hearts. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. Well, let's turn in the Bible to Matthew 14. I said, we don't really know what these gifts are because typically there's no definition. We are fortunate with the gift of faith that we do have a definition in Hebrews 11.1. But we also want to go and look at where did this actually take place in the Bible? And looking at that, it would help us understand the gift of faith much better. I can think of no better place than the story of Peter walking on the water. Very familiar uh, story from the New Testament. But let's go back and look at it in a new light. That would be the light of faith. And where is faith playing a role for Peter? as he goes through this experience. I'm going to start at verse 22, and I'm going to read the whole story, because it's a fun story. Immediately after what Jesus had been doing previously, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, which means about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake, and when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. 
Is it a ghost? They said and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Peter then says, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. Hmm. Jesus must have loved this expression of faith. And maybe with a smile said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. I want you to imagine this. Peter actually got out of a boat in a raging storm. The wind and the waves are hitting this boat. And Peter, without a second thought, hears Jesus say, come. He gets out of the boat. And then he does the impossible, the supernatural. He walks on the water. Peter actually did that. He walked on the water. Let's go back to the story, beginning at verse 30 which isn't such a good moment for Peter here. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! He took his eyes off of Jesus, and he started to notice the surroundings. So immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught him, and then said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, in the moment Peter got out of the boat, it was supernatural. I mean, it was incredible that Peter actually took the risk to get out of the boat. He believed that Jesus would do it so much. I didn't even think about it. It's like, you sit down in a chair. You don't think about it. Peter got out of the boat. Didn't even think about it. But then the other side of faith came in. He was no longer filled with the Spirit. He was filled with fear because he looked around and said, Huh, I'm not supposed to be here. What am I doing? I'm on water. It's raging. And so he then began to sink. And Jesus reached out and saved him. I want you to think of the moment when he got out of the boat. That's the gift of faith. The gift of faith that sometimes I exhibit, perhaps you do, is the part that looks at my circumstances and says, Oh man, Lord, you're not going to help me. This is, I'm going to die. And God doesn't do that. Well, I have a personal example from my life. In the fall of 2006, I got a phone call that everybody dreads. My mom, at the age of 74, said, Steve, I have some bad news. I have cancer. It's stage five, which is the worst. You don't recover from stage five. And the cancer has spread throughout my entire body. My mom, the person who brought me into the world, is cancer. She's dying. Well, at Christmas time, my two brothers and I, we flew down to Florida. We spent time with my mom. At that point, the cancer had not progressed so far that she was disabled. And we enjoyed a wonderful time with her, and yet a very sad time, because we knew it may be the last time we see her alive, and certainly the last time we would see her well. As we went back to Chicago, and my one brother who lived in Florida stayed there to take care of her, people from a group called Hospice came and they attended to her. It's a wonderful organization. They come alongside people who are dying and they take care of their needs. They make sure that uh, they get enough food, they take their medicine, they wipe their brow if they're sweating, they take their temperature, and they stay with them until death comes. Well, I got another phone call in March of 2007. And my brother said, Steve, you and Dave, you better fly down to Florida. Mom's dying. 
So we got on a plane, got down there as fast as we could. We drove to mom's house. And like some people who are dying often do, I think my mom was waiting until we got there. Because she lying in bed, dying, she saw her three sons standing in front of the bed. She looked up and smiled and said, I love you all. And then she slipped into glory. Well, when my mom and I were together one time at Christmas, and my other brothers were out running some errands, I said, Mom, aren't you ever afraid of death? And she smiled and she looked at me and said, Steve, I'm just going to close my eyes. And when I open them, I'm going to see Jesus. That's faith. My mom had the gift of faith and the gift of intercession. She prayed for me constantly and she believed with all her heart that God would do the things he said. My mom was a wonderful example of faith. Well, I have some questions to ask you. You might have expected this. And as I ask these questions, Look at your life and ask, how has God been working in my life? Has he done these things in my life? Or are these things that I can imagine God doing within me? If so, you might have the gift of faith. Has God worked through you to believe that God will fulfill his promises and then he does it? Has God worked through you to trust that when he doesn't do something, eventually he will. And finally, has God worked through you to believe without a doubt that he will fulfill his promises no matter what? If you can answer yes to one or more of these questions, I would like you to consider you may have the gift of faith. And if you're not sure, as I mentioned before, the only way to know for sure is to try it out. As you go through your prayer life, notice what happens in you. Do you believe as you're praying, yes, God's going to do this? Or do you start to say, well, I don't know. Good indicator of whether or not you have this gift. Well, in our next session, we'll look at another spiritual gift, this time the gift of knowledge, and we hope that you'll join us then.